All right. Welcome. This is an MIT first. We are starting. Oh, my, now it's 7.01. But we're very, very close. So welcome, everybody, to the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. My name is Erica Reinfeld. I run the public outreach program here, which includes our public lecture series with Insight. So thank you so much for coming out on a rainy December night uh, for this program. We are so excited to have all of our presenters here. Um, before we jump into the content, I just want to tell, or in some cases remind you, uh, that the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research is MIT's Cancer Research Center. We bring together biologists and engineers uh, to develop new insights, approaches, and technologies uh, for fighting cancer. Um, as a NCI-designated basic cancer research center, one of the greatest outcomes that we can hope for is that the work that we're doing in our laboratories makes its way to patients. And that is part of why we are so excited about um, tonight's program. So I think, oops, um, before, so I'm just gonna turn it, we're gonna jump right into the program and I'm gonna introduce Michael Yaffe, who is the David H., among other things, the David H. Koch Professor of Science and the director of MIT's uh, Center for Precision Cancer Medicine. So come on up, Mike. And Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Uh, as Erica said, I'm Mike Yaffe, and I'm the director of the MIT Center for Precision Cancer Medicine. And what I thought I would tell you about in the next six minutes or so is our general approach to precision cancer medicine, focusing on how to combine some computational and experimental work, really with a focus here on prostate cancer. And I have to tell you that, um, that our approach to precision cancer medicine is probably a little different than what you might read in the newspaper. Um, it certainly starts with, the, with everything that you have heard, which is that precision cancer medicine starts by sequencing a patient's tumors and looking at the, the, the expression levels of different RNAs in the tumor. But what we believe at the Center for Precision Cancer Medicine is that this is a great start, but this alone, we know, has not delivered the promises that, that were told to people by being able to do this. And that is, we think that in addition to this data, which is really what we have right now, we need to combine this with additional data, proteomic data and signaling pathway data, in order to find the tumor-specific vulnerabilities that tell us the right combinations of drugs or drugs and radiation therapy that will work together to kill tumor cells. Now, everything that we do in our laboratory is governed by a basic hypothesis, and that is that the treatment of outcome of cancer cells must be some function of what we do to the cells. That is, if we radiate the cells or we treat them with chemotherapy, these extracellular cues are somehow integrated with the state of the cell at the time to control the outcome, whether the treatment results in cell death, which is what we would like for a tumor, or makes the cells migrate or metastasize or proliferate where they are, or different differentiate. And of course, at MIT, you can't call it science if you can't write an equation. And so our equation is that the response of the tumors to treatment must be some function, not just of the inputs, but of the signals that are happening inside the cell. And our goal is to try to understand what this function is, because that's the information processing algorithm that tells how the external stimuli and internal stimuli are integrated to control what the tumor does. And if we understood what was happening in here, we would have a better understanding of what to do here to get particular responses that we wanted over here. Now, one easy way, of course, as engineers that we can think about, uh, about cancer is to think about an analogy between biological circuits that control outputs and electrical circuits. Now, in the case of electrical circuits, we already know that that the, the circuitry controls the different inputs to give us a precise set of outputs. And I would argue that the same thing is true in biological circuits. In biological circuits, a series of different inputs get read and they give us a series of different outputs. And we can think of proteins and molecular interactions as the wiring that carries the current of signaling, which is what controls how the different outputs are mediated by the various different inputs. And let's go a little further with this wiring analogy. Now, because I think this can help us understand how to think about tumor cells and why they're maybe different than normal cells. So let's take an example that you're all familiar with, and that's the wiring diagram of your house. 
of course, electricity comes into your house, and then it goes through your fuse box, and then it's distributed into circuits that control your hot water heater, your furnace, your kitchen, and a bunch of different lights, all with different switches. And if I wanted to identify what the critical node was to say, turn off all the electricity to your bedroom, it would be easy. I just go to the circuit breaker, and I find whatever the circuit breaker is that controls, for example, uh, the circuit that goes to your bedroom. And if I flip that switch, no more power to the bedroom. And that's why it's easy to kill normal cells, because normal cells are wired this way. It's easy to stop them from proliferating or to force them to differentiate, because I can find the critical node and turn it off. The problem is that cancer cells are wired a lot more like the internet than the fuse box in your house. And by that, I mean that, as you know, in the internet, the wiring is completely interconnected and it's very dynamic. And so if I take down one server or I take down another server, the internet simply rewires to bypass that and keeps going. So if I wanted to, and that's one of the reasons I would argue why it's hard to kill cancer cells. If I take down the server that's in your basement, that's not going to stop the internet. And so the key is I have to find the right critical nodes in cancer. I have to find the Googles and Amazons to take those down in order to really break a cancer cell. And that's what's been really, really difficult. And so our hope has been that by understanding the nature of the circuit and throwing enough mathematics and modeling at it, we could identify what those critical nodes were. And then we could target those critical nodes. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of detail, not too much, and tell you that Cells that, that, that those, those cell circuits that I showed you are built largely of things that look like Lego bricks. And some of those Lego bricks are protein kinases that go around and take, stick phosphate groups on proteins. And then there are a bunch of other Lego blocks that read those phosphorylated sequences, and I use those to build that molecular circuit. And the question, and of course what we would really like to understand, is how that circuit is built and targeted. And one of our favorite nodes that we were hoping would be involved is a protein called pololite kinase 1, because that's got one of those kinases and it's got some of those, those modules that I showed you. And this is a molecule that we had been working on basically for almost 20 years. Now, we think it's a critical node because this protein, PLK1, is critical for taking one cell and turning it into two cells. In fact, every step of the process by which a cell divides, how it builds a mitotic spindle, how it pulls the chromosomes apart, how the cells divide, depends on the activity of PLK1. So our hope was that PLK1 would turn out to be the Google or Amazon of the cancer cell internet. Now, as I said, we're, we're an academic lab, and we were really pretty cancer agnostic. And we were very lucky because of a very generous agreement that was made between the Koch Institute and Janssen Pharmaceuticals, a, brand, a, a, a company from Johnson & Johnson. And Janssen Pharmaceuticals had a big interest in prostate cancer. And you'll hear a lot more about pololite kinase 1 from Jesse Patterson and a lot more about prostate cancer from David Eisenstein in just a moment. Janssen Pharmaceuticals had a great drug, abiraterone acetate, otherwise known as Zytiga. And they were interested in figuring out how you could use, how you could use abiraterone more effectively to treat prostate cancer. Because as you'll hear, it was already approved for treatment of prostate cancer. And maybe we could use this better. Maybe there was a way to use this if we only knew what the critical nodes were to combine this with something targeting some critical nodes. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to David Einstein to tell you a little bit more about prostate cancer. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm really excited to be here tonight and give you a clinician's perspective on all of this. So I'm going to briefly introduce you to uh, what the problem is and what tar tools we have at the moment. And then uh, you're going to hear a little bit more from me later after we hear some, some good science. So first of all, what's the problem? Well, unfortunately, as a prostate cancer doc, I have no shortage of business. Uh, prostate cancer is the leading diagnosis um, among men of non-skin cancer uh, cancers. And uh, it's also the second leading cancer killer among US men. Now, you'll notice that there are a lot more people diagnosed with prostate cancer than dying of prostate cancer. So any individual with prostate cancer has a relatively low risk of dying of it. But because there's so many people diagnosed with it, even a relatively small percentage translates into a large absolute number. And in addition, as people stop smoking so much, and perhaps as we do less PSA screening, we're a little bit concerned that these uh, may switch um, and that prostate cancer could, in fact, become the number one cancer killer. 
So what tools do we have at the moment? If I sit down with a patient in the clinic with metastatic disease, what can I use to treat their disease? Well, I first tell them that prostate cancer is a disease that's driven by the androgen receptor. Um, and so most of the things that we do are directed at that. Now, for decades now, we've known that medical or surgical castration can be quite effective. Um, and for a while, that's pretty much all we had. Um, but in the last 10 years or so, we've had a number of new agents aimed at either blocking the, the, uh, uh, the binding of androgens to this androgen receptor that's hanging out in the cytoplasm of a prostate cancer cell or even a normal prostate cell, um, or stopping the synthesis of androgens from other places like the adrenal glands or even these tumor cells are pretty crafty. They can learn how to make their own androgens when they become resistant to castration. So we call this androgen deprivation therapy. It's an old standby. And then we call these hormone pills androgen signaling inhibitors. And those are pills that have been approved by the FDA in the last 10 years or so and are part of our standard clinical armamentarium. So we're especially interested in this abiraterone drug, which as you've heard, um, is a drug that helps prevent the synthesis of androgens and therefore knocks down this whole signaling pathway and stops the cells from dividing and, and, and surviving. So abiraterone was approved um, based off of originally a trial done in patients who were castration resistant and had already been treated with chemo, and they saw a small but significant survival advantage, you know, on the order of four months versus placebo. And then subsequently, they tried it before chemo. And again, you know, you saw it go, the survival go from about 30 months to about 35 months. So small but significant, and that led to FDA approval. But the biggest news story has been moving this even further forward in the disease spectrum into those patients who are still castration sensitive. So it turns out that by combining castration with one of these drugs, rather than waiting for castration resistance, we can have much larger uh, survival advantages than we're seeing later on. So the spectrum of prostate cancer therapy has become quite a bit more complex, but suffice it to say that some of these agents are used in patients who are still castration sensitive, and others might get these drugs after having prior chemo and hormone therapy and get it at the time of castration resistance. And there's a lot of research into these patients who have already been through all these drugs and need other uh, novel therapies. There's a lot of mechanisms of resistance to this, and to keep this simple, Prostate cancer remains a primarily androgen receptor-driven disease even after all of these androgen receptor therapies have been exhausted. There are some other rarer subtypes, um, so we're just learning more about these and how to target them, um, but primarily it's all about the androgen receptor. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jesse, and I'll come back later. Thank you, David. So as, as Mike mentioned, I'm a postdoc in his lab. And when I joined his lab, one of the things I was interested in was finding, finding ways to improve the efficacy of this anti-androgen abiraterone. Um, abiraterone shuts down androgen synthesis, but also in, shuts down the androgen receptor pathway in general. As David just mentioned, the androgen receptor pathway is the central node in prostate cancer. And at face value, it looks like a fairly simple pathway. In reality, however, there are numerous proteins that interact with the androgen receptor pathway or cooperate with it to further enhance the castrate-resistant prostate cancer phenotype. So we figured, given all these different interactions between the central node of prostate cancer, are there any other nodes in cancer in general that may interact with the androgen receptor and drive prostate cancer growth? And could we inhibit them to further enhance the effects of abiraterone? So we, so, in order to do this, we use two different types of prostate cancer cells. One are, represent the early stages of prostate cancer, and they're called LINCAPs. The other type of can prostate cancer cells we use are called C42 cells, and they represent advanced stages of prostate cancer. So basically, I read a lot of papers and thought about the signaling networks in prostate cancer quite a lot, um, came up with a group of, of drugs that I would try combining with abiraterone to see if when I combined them, if I got even more effects than I would expect just from the addition of those two drugs. When I do these types of experiments, I um, take the cancer cells, so in this case it's castrate-resistant prostate cancer C42 cells, and I subject them to increasing concentrations of the abiraterone antiandrogen. The black line represents the response of the C42 castrate-resistant prostate cancer cells to increasing concentrations of abiraterone. This red line here is the same experiment, uh, and sorry, the further down this line drops, the more that drug either killed the cells or prevented their growth. 
Um, I then repeat that experiment, increasing concentrations of abiraterone in the presence of a constant amount of a second drug. In this case, this experiment was done with a class of drugs known as PLK1 inhibitors. The gray line is what you expect if these drugs are just additive. It is the pharmacological equivalent of one plus one equals two. If the effect of the drugs in combination is greater than you expect, so if there is a difference between the gray and the red lines, then that, that is a synergistic drug combination. And these are useful for numerous reason, reasons, uh, most notably of which is the, the potential for greater efficacy. Um, so clearly, in this advanced model of this model of advanced prostate cancer, we see synergy between this class of drugs called PLK1 inhibitors and abiraterone. Interestingly, in the model of androgen-dependent or castrate-sensitive prostate cancer, we don't see any synergy. The gray line and red line are basically overlapping, meaning that we got the expected result of one plus one equals two. To us, this indicates that the signaling networks in castrate-resistant prostate cancer cells might have been rewired in a manner that makes them sensitive to this particular combination of drugs of PLK1 inhib inhibitors and abiraterone. So as Mike mentioned, PLK1 is a central signaling node in mitosis. It regulates almost every step in the process of this, this cell division. Um, so it's very well known that inhibition of PLK1 mucks up the progression through mitosis and cells get stuck in it. They get arrested in mitosis. What we have found is that the combination of abiraterone and PLK1 inhibitors synergistically um, messes up uh, mitosis so that you get even stronger mitotic arrest. And just to show you what I'm talking about, these are prostate cancer cells. Um, red here represents the DNA, and green represents the structural components that can separate the DNA from one nucleus to um, the opposite poles of the cell, and then the cell will divide so one cell turns into two. You can see the DNA condense, it pulls apart to the opposite sides, and you get two cells from where there was one. It's really quite a beautiful process. When we treat prostate cancer cells with this combination of drugs, instead of the cell dividing, it tries to divide, it aligns with DNA, it tries to divide, it tries to divide, but instead of achieving that, it ends up dead. Maybe unfortunately for that cell, but fortunately for, for us, this combination is leading to a synergistic arrest in mitosis followed by a synergistic cell death. So um, David mentioned that there are multiple types of antiandrogens. One is called abiraterone, and that's what I've been talking about. There are other types of antiandrogens being used, most notably of which is enzalutamide. This antiandrogen specifically inhibits androgen receptor signaling. Um, so we figured since we saw synergy with abiraterone, um, we, we should test other antiandrogens. But interestingly, in these prostate cancer cells, all we got was the additive result, one plus one equals two, indicating to us that the synergy we're seeing with abiraterone and PLK1 inhibitors, while it might involve androgen receptor signaling, androgen receptor signaling does not see a, seem to be a sufficient explanation for this synergy. Um, so that suggested to us that perhaps the combination of abiraterone and PLK1 inhibition might also work in other types of cancer cells that don't necessarily depend on androgen receptor signaling. So for example, here we, are, we tested the combination of abiraterone and PLK1 inhibitors in an ovarian cancer cell line. And quite clearly, the effects of the drugs went way beyond the expected value. There's quite a large difference between the gray and the red bars. Um, so this raises the possibility that this drug combination could also be useful in non-prostate cancer settings. Furthermore, we've tested the effects of this drug combination in a mouse model of cancer um, using this rather slick tumor implantable device that was developed right here in this building by Ollie Jonas. And this was part of a collaboration through a bridge project grant with Ollie Jonas and Steve Balk. So what this device is, is a very tiny cylinder. In each cylinder, there are more than a dozen microwells. Each microwell is loaded with a drug and then the entire device is implanted into a tumor. In our case, this tumor was grown on the back of a mouse. Although Ollie has also um, implanted these into tumors and patients. Uh, once the device is implanted, each of the, each of the microwells, which contain either a different drug or a different combination of drugs, those drugs then diffuse into spatially distinct um, concentration gradients, subjecting the immediately adjacent cells to that treatment. I'm showing here a depiction of 
the cancer cells in relation to the device. So the cancer cells are in purple, the device is in gray, the drug was located in this little divot here, and the red gradient represents the drug diffusing from the well and being most concentrated immediately adjacent to the well, but gradually diminishing in concentration. So we tested these drugs, PLK1 inhibitors and abiraterone, in prostate cancer xenografts, and then took those cells and stained them so that if they, if they had died, they would turn brown. So in these images, if you see brown cells, brown little circles, that means that cell was dying. And quite clearly, in the field of cells that was immediately adjacent to wells containing both PLK1 inhibitor and abiraterone, we see a substantial amount of tumor cell death that we don't see at, in, in cells that were adjacent to abiraterone alone or PLK1 inhibitors alone at these doses. When we quantified this, it was quite clear that the combination of drugs was packing a much stronger punch than we would expect simply by adding these drugs together. We furthermore confirmed that we can synergize, these drugs will synergize in non-prostate cancer cells using those ovarian cancer cells that I just mentioned. Once again, the cells that were immediately adjacent to a well containing both drugs result, um, had much more cell death than cells that were adjacent to wells containing either drug alone quantified here. It's clearly synergistic. <coughs> So basically, at this point, we had a very interesting synergistic drug combination on our hand that had the potential to be clinically useful, but also was interesting for scientific reasons. And we, we combined these drugs based, of a based off a model of inhibition of angina receptor signaling. However, subsequent data s indicated to us that inhibition of angina receptor signaling was not a sufficient explanation. So we wanted to figure out what the exact mechanism was. And to do that, um, one of the things I've done in the AFI lab was devise and utilize this method we call Visage, which is a combined experimental and computational approach to understanding the mechanisms of drug synergy. Essentially, what I do is take a large panel of different types of cancer cells and then subject them to this dose matrix with increasing concentrations of PLK1 inhibitor, increasing concentrations of abiraterone in all pairwise combinations, calculate the effects of those drugs, and then quantify the synergy in this volumetric manner. We then take those synergistic measurements, combine them with molecular data sets to find genes or pathways that correlate with the synergy, um, and that can be mechanistically informative. Basically, what I'm saying is that I take a bunch of different type of cancer cells, and I say, okay, in these cancer cells, I see a lot of synergy, and these cancer cells, I don't see much synergy. And then, in those cancer cells that showed synergy, this signaling node is on, and in the cancer cells that didn't show synergy, that signaling node is off. And if there's a strong correspondence between the activity of the signaling node and the amount of synergy we observe, that's a pretty good indication that it might be mechanistically related to the synergy. So we have done that with this combination in a panel of 86 different cancer cells lines. We've also measured all of the genes expression levels um, in those two prostate cancer cell lines I mentioned, both before and after treatment with these drugs. And what both of these things have indicated to us um, is that of the various steps involved in mitosis and of the various parts of that that PLK1 regulates, both of these things have pointed to perhaps a specific mechanism of APC activation. APC, active, APC stands for the anaphase promoting complex. It regulates the transition from the metaphase stage of mitosis to the anaphase stage of mitosis, and it is essential for cell division. During all this work, we got a call from Mark Erlander at Trovagene, and he told us about their PLK1 inhibitor, and that really pushed this project to a whole new level. Um, but currently, we're working together with David Einstein and Steve Balk through a new bridge project grant, as well as with the team at Trovagene through a sponsored research agreement. And our shared goals are to further uncover the mechanistic details of this drug synergy and hopefully be able to find ways to identify the patients that will respond to it. And if we can achieve these things, I strongly believe it'll help us understand the preliminary data we have from the clinical trials that are underway and it, the, those, in, that information would be almost essential, or I think it would be very important, for any potential future clinical trials. So I'm going to hand it over to Mark, who told, was going to talk about how we, we teamed up. OK. So thank you. Thank you. you. OK. Well, thank you, all of you, for coming. And um, let me now tell you a little bit about Trovagene. Trovagene, we have the worst weather, um, much worse than you guys do. Uh, we're based in San Diego, so I, I know you feel sorry for me already. 
Um, we're really a, we're actually a small little biotech. We kind of uh, tease ourselves and other people who ask where we are. We always say that we're in the biotech ghetto of San Diego. It's the low, low rent district. Um, we, have, we, we don't have snow days there, but we're right on next to an estuary that flows into the Pacific Ocean. And so whenever it rains, we have rain days and a lot of mud. And we have to literally get in our cars and get out before we get trapped. So, so now, that I've, now that I've got you feeling sorry for us, we're a clinical stage oncology company. Uh, we're publicly traded NASDAQ. Uh, we have a lead drug candidate called Onbansertib. It's really a first-in-class, third-generation uh, oral drug, and it's highly selective for just PLK1 um, inhibitor. And we have, uh, as I speak right now, we have three ongoing clinical trials. Uh, one of them is a phase two trial here that you're hearing about in uh, castor-resistant prostate cancer with the three Harvard Medical Schools with David Einstein as the principal investigator. Uh, but we also have a, a KRAS mutated metastatic colorectal cancer trial going on with Mayo Clinic and USC. And then we also have a, a hematological uh, trial going on in, in AML with uh, eight sites across the country with the PI out of Yale. So this is really what we're doing, and that's the molecule. We really um, are de really at a, a crux here of in 2020 that we'll be able to start to announce some of our phase two data. And we really are, uh, as, as a small biotech company, uh, we really look at what the strategy is for value creation. Um, and, and bottom line is that we are really using Onvansertib as a platform, uh, as I'll talk about in a couple more minutes, of why we think it is as a sing single molecule, it's actually a platform for uh, having combinations with a multitude of different uh, drugs and different cancer types. Um, right now, as we look at what we're doing today, uh, we have, the, you can see the metastatic CRPC on phase, two, phase 2A. We also have colorectal cancer, AML. We also have triple negative breast cancer, which uh, we might be starting an investigate initiated trial in 2020. Um, you know, PLK1 um, is, uh, you know, Invansertib inhibits the poli kinase 1, and it's really been established as a therapeutic target, and it's also known to be overexpressed in a multitude of different cancer types. This is a little bit more about it. It's really a PLK1 specific ATP competitive inhibitor. Uh, one of the things that you'll see up on the left there is that uh, evolutionarily there are other PLKs that are related structurally. And this is really the first molecule to have high selectivity for just PLK1. And that's really important because PLK2 and 3 do other things as well that we don't really particularly want to maybe inhibit. Um, also, the other thing about it is that we're showing here the actual crystal, co-crystal structure and showing that really the glutamate 140 residue in the PL ATP, ATP binding site of PLK1 is crucial for this selectivity, uh, which this glutamate is not present in PLK2 and 3. And this is a little bit more about it. The bottom line is that um, the half-life of the pharmacokinetics of this molecule are, it's, it's got a 24-hour half-life. It also, um, within three hours, it reaches at Cmax in, in a patient who takes it orally. So within three hours, they have the highest concentration of drug in the blood. Um, the, uh, then really, to sort of summarize this, it's really, it's highly selective for PLK1. It's uh, synergistic, which we'll talk a little bit more about. And the half-life of 24 hours allows us to have flexibility in our dosing. Uh, which is very important. Uh, previous generations of this uh, drug class, uh, particularly uh, one of them that went into clinical trials, had a half-life of five and a half days, and that became a real problem. We, there's not enough flexibility there. As I said, um, on Vansertib, or our, our PLK1 inhibitor, um, it has really synergy. Uh, you know, Jesse was talking to you about synergy with uh, abiraterone but it actually has synergy with a multitude of FDA-approved drugs in a multitude of different tumor types. And so we really see this, the ones that are in the teal color are the ones that are involved in our current three clinical trials. But we also think that there's opportunity on, in these, and then there's opportunity, even one that uh, we've been talking to Mike Yaffe about, another molecule where there is incredible synergy. Um, so this is really, we think this is an opportunity, the synergy. So, you know, our journey, you know, just to, you know, talk a little bit more about it, our journey and who are the cast of characters that were involved in this process? 
you know, we're up here at Biotech Beach, uh, San Diego, way up there at the top there. And I thought, hmm, I wonder if I can talk these guys into working with the little engine that could. That's a little small little biotech in San Diego. So I reached out to um, Mike. He says, Trovagene who? And uh, he said, well, I guess if they're, they're buying, I'll, I'll have a coffee with them. And that's literally what happened. He basically came down in scrubs, and I think he might have bought his own coffee. But, um, but we had coffee and talked. And then across the, the little ways across the way, David Einstein said, hmm, come to think of it, I have a protocol design. All I need is a PLK inhibitor. Wonder where I can find one. So that actually was what happened there, is that through Mike Yaffe, uh, he also uh, does other things besides being this professor at, at MIT. Uh, he's also a, a surgeon, and he's at Beth Israel. And he has some of his best friends are in GU, uh, Glenn Blubley. And we, he reached out to his friend, who was the head of GU oncology there. And Glenn Bubbly said, well, actually, I know exactly who could work with you on this, and that was David Einstein. So David got the, uh, got the football. <laughs> and so then, of course, you know, there's one person that we've left out of this whole thing, and that's, um, you know, basically it says, by the way, let's not forget who came up with this brilliant idea. <laughs> well, I thought it was kind of funny when, I, when we put it together. <laughs> Okay, so how did we get to where we are today? Number one, Mike Yaffe and Jesse Patterson uh, had a patent, MIT patent, that basically uh, very broad claims that is a US patent, it's issued, there's two now, the third one pending, that really is, uh, its claims are very broad of any PLK inhibitor with any antiandrogen for treating a patient of any cancer type. Basically, it's that broad. And so we uh, at Trovagene did an exclusive license uh, with MIT to get this patent. So the next thing is we obviously had this conversation with David Einstein and um, talked him into this trial. And so he, this is really what started at, at really at Beth Israel, but then he expanded to all of his friends uh, at MGH and also at Dana-Farber. And then we really have been working on optimiza optimization of the dosing and scheduling and assessing the safety and efficacy. And David's going to talk to you a little bit about the data that we have so far. And uh, so far, 16 patients have completed 12 weeks of treatment. And you'll see some of the swimmer plots on that. So one thing that we also wanted to put up here is that this is why we are developing on Vansertiv. It's Frank, who's a patient who's here. He's come uh, that you can. You, can talk to. Um, and uh, we uh, uh, really, Vicki, uh, my partner in crime at Trovagene, she runs our clinical development, um, basically um, somehow got a picture of you, Frank. I think it was through your wife. <laughs> oh, your sister. Okay. All right. <laughs> so anyway, hopefully um, we can really be able to help not only Frank, but others like him. Thank you very much, and I'm going to turn it over now to David. Thanks. Frank's been lobbying to get his uh, face on the bottle for a long time now, so it finally happened. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we think about designing trials in this space and then tell you a little bit about how this trial has gone. So as I mentioned, we have a lot of tools that we didn't used to have, and we're still working on the sequencing of all of these things. And so it turns out to be remarkably complex to think through all the different options and all the different sequences that a patient might be going through. And then to pick where in that sequence am I going to design a trial that's going to test an experimental therapy. Um, and so what we did is we decided uh, to take patients who were on standard of care abiraterone, who were just starting to become resistant. Their PSAs were just starting to rise. And the standard of care in that situation would be to pay attention, not necessarily rush to the next thing, but to start assessing via scans and via symptoms more regularly 
and then uh, switch to the next therapy once uh, another form of progression happened. And so we said, well, what if we take those patients and try to drag our feet even more and try to stretch out the effectiveness of that if this drug really is synergistic with abiraterone? Uh, and so that's the clinical space that we ended up with. And we've taken patients who are uh, on abiraterone either started for castration-sensitive disease or castration-resistant, but have started to develop this early resistance. And we started out with the phase two recommended dose from a prior phase one trial. Um, and then uh, Trovagine has been really remarkably committed to optimizing the dosing of this drug. So we'll talk a little bit more about this. But since, we've opened up uh, another arm, and uh, we've actually proposed a third arm, um, just really trying to tweak this. And uh, what we decided to look at as a primary endpoint um, in a patient population where you would expect ongoing PSA rise was to see whether three months into therapy, did their PSAs stabilize or decrease? And then also look at a lot of other endpoints like time on therapy, change in imaging, things like that. Um, and finally, we're always interested in, in uh, going further with the science and using some exploratory endpoints to look at potential biomarkers and also to understand more about the mechanisms. So uh, these are some preliminary data. This is still early on, but this is what's called a swimmer's plot if you haven't seen one before. And each of these uh, numbers is really a patient. Um, and uh, what you see here in blue are the pa patients who started out on the initial arm A with the original dosing. Um, and we saw that, you know, as indicated by the stars here, a couple of these patients did achieve the primary endpoint. Um, and uh, I believe, uh, you know, this yellow box here shows a couple of patients who had a partial response on a scan, meaning a little bit of shrinkage of a cancer. Um, but we wanted to do better, and so we opened this arm. And of the four patients here, three of them have already achieved that primary endpoint of stability or decrease in their PSA. Um, and uh, one of our patients had a really remarkable PSA response um, that lasted for many, many months um, and, uh, and felt better as well, which is the most important thing. Um, so uh, we're also, of course, very interested in safety. We're still learning about this drug. But as uh, others have mentioned, the primary toxicity here is on any rapidly dividing cell, and that includes the bone marrow. And so the main side effect seems to be lowering of the blood counts. Um, and the good thing is that this drug, like Mark mentioned, has a very short half-life. So you know, if you get into trouble, you can quickly stop it, let the bone marrow recover, and then start at a lower dose. And so we've been able to use a combination of dose delays, reductions, and growth factor support to maintain patients on therapy. So what's next with all of this? So you know, I think that we've mentioned the word biomarker, but I just wanted to make sure that everybody's clear on what that means. So a biomarker is basically a test that can potentially tell you which patients are going to benefit or not benefit from a particular treatment. Um, and so, you know, from a regulatory standpoint, if a drug is approved for a specific subpopulation of patients, that's potentially going to be approved together with a companion diagnostic assay, which is going to be the biomarker that tells you whether that patient can get that drug. Um, and so this could be done on tumor samples. It could be done on bits of tumor that are circulating in the blood, accessed via a quote unquote liquid biopsy. And it could be done at all sorts of different uh, levels uh, with different techniques. Um, so we're interested in that, um, in particular, uh, you know, biomarkers like uh, loss of the RB protein um, and uh, also uh, APC, as, as, as Jesse was mentioning. Um, drug delivery. So we've really spent a lot of time, and Trovagine has been very uh, uh, committed to, you know, modeling all of the uh, scenarios here and trying to figure out how we can get more drug into patients safely and effectively. Um, and then finally, the most important thing is probably understanding the mechanism here so that we can figure out if this is really independent of androgen receptor, is there a better partner than abiraterone? Um, and also, are there patients with other cancers, for example, ovarian cancer, who might also benefit from a combination that, you know, typically they wouldn't be treated with abiraterone or anything in combination? So lots of people involved here. Most importantly, our patients and their families, including Frank, um, but also Glenn Bubbly, who's the senior investigator here, the Steve Balk Lab, and Andreas, who's been working with us, our whole clinical trials team. And then Jesse and Mike, you've, of course, heard from. I don't need to introduce them. But we have other site PIs at uh, uh, the DFHCC uh, institutions who have been instrumental in accru accruing patients to this. Um, so with big thanks to Trovagine and the Bridge Project, um, I'll, uh, I'll end there. So, uh, so what we're going to do now is invite all of our presenters to come up, and we're going to grab stools as I talk, um, and just have a conversation amongst themselves. You've kind of seen everyone one-on-one, -on -one, and now we're going to 
experience some synergy by putting them all together, and then we will have some time. Uh, we'll open the floor up to questions from you. Make yourselves comfortable. So I've been tasked with being the moderator, and I'm only going to throw two questions out um, because I really want to open it up to the audience to ask questions. But the first question that I want to ask, our, ask everyone involved here was, why did this work so well? I mean, when you think about it, the odds that someone is going to be a postdoc in a lab and start with cells in a dish, <laughs> and a few years later end up with a drug trial in patients, is, is the probability of that has got to be approaching zero. And yet this worked, and it worked remarkably well. And I would love to know why so we could do more of this. <laughs> Your thoughts, Mark. So it's always about timing in life, isn't it? Um, and I think it's just the things kind of came together. The planets uh, all aligned. Um, for me, it started with um, the chairman of the board of our, our company, Tom Adams. He actually um, was the um, uh, chief technology officer for a little company called Hybertech in San Diego, and they developed the first PSA test. And um, so he, he, because of that, was very active in, in, with PSA, and he, he really developed that first test that uh, Eli Lilly then bought that company. And um, anyway, make, make a long story short, um, he shot me an email and said, hey, Mark, um, there's this guy Yaffe at MIT. Um, I don't know anything about him, but he's got this patent that just got issued. And it, it looks pretty interesting to me. It's uh, this thing about PLK and, and abiraterone. You should check it out. So you know, when your chairman of the board sends you a little email, I don't get that many from him. Um, I said, I'll check it out. So that's actually what happened when I called him. And he goes, boop. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, so, I think, so I think that's how it started. And um, you know, I think that a lot of times uh, you know, these things are, um, you know, we, we, were, you know, we were also really looking for um, some unique uh, and, and new approaches with this drug. Uh, we haven't really talked to you about the drug, but there's some people here that know about this PLK drug class. And uh, it's been around for quite a while. And uh, there was a generation one and two, and quite frankly, big pharma passed on it. And so, um, and there was toxicity issues, and they were, they were pan inhibitors. And so this one was unique, because it was selected only PLK1, but we were really looking for where do we go with this? And, and really, what was going on here at MIT was really very fascinating to us. And we thought, gee, this could be something new. So that's, I took a lot of the air time. I apologize. But, but that is really how it got started, is that we were looking for new, you know, new and innovative things. And MIT had this. And I said, this is worth, uh, this is worth flying across the country. David, why could we get this into trials? There are lots of findings in mouse models and other things that we do here, but we were able to get this into a human clinical trial remarkably easily. David, thoughts on why we were able to make that happen? Yeah, I mean, I think that any time you're creating a clinical trial, there has to be an unmet need. And so you, know, you saw in some of those curves I showed earlier for patients getting abiraterone, you know, we're doing OK, but we're not doing as well as we should be. And so I think everyone knows that we need to do better and that resistance to these drugs is universal. So there's no doubt about it that uh, there's an unmet need. And we had a drug that had already been through phase one testing, which makes it a lot easier from the perspective of you know, getting it up and running uh, without a whole phase one infrastructure. Um, and then I think the other thing that really convinced us uh, to participate in it, because we need to feel like we're really, you know, uh, heading down the right path and you know putting our patients in the, in the you know n not in harm's way uh, is you know that you guys didn't stop at just doing the work in cells. Uh, a, a lot of cells have been cured. Uh, it turns out to be remarkably easy to kill cells, uh, both normal ones and cancer. Right? Uh, probably easier to kill the normal ones. And uh, so you know it was tested in a lot of different models and a lot of different scenarios. And I think that helps us feel more confident that it makes sense to put it into a patient. Jesse, we were able to work with Trovagene. I wonder if you would comment on why you think this worked with Trovagene um, when many interactions um, with 
particularly with large pharmaceutical companies, have not been quite as successful? I mean, they've just been very open and very willing to collaborate with us. They want to work as a team, and they want they want us to succeed, and they want to succeed, and they realize that if if we both if if the trial works, everyone wins. Um, but I think yeah, a lot of what David said was true. That the fact that um, both drugs had been fairly clinically tested before made it easier to to justify putting them together. And um, yeah, I will say that when when I met Mark and we had coffee. Um, I, I, I've interacted with pharmaceutical companies over things we've had a couple of different times over the years. And when I met Mark, at that point, I was pretty skeptical. And I said, listen, we'd love to work with you. But I can tell you right now what's going to happen. You're going to throw a bunch of lawyers at us. And our lawyers are going to talk to your lawyers. And it'll be dead. There, we will never move this beyond this. And Mark said, oh, no. He said, trust me. I will push the lawyers out of the way, and we will make this happen. And I thought, yeah, I'll never see this guy again. And sure <laughs> enough, look what happened. So the, the, the last question I want us to discuss before we open it up to you is, what's next? Where do we go from here? Jesse, let me start with you this time. Um, quite clearly, the, the big elephant in the room is, what, why are these drugs synergistic? And we, we've worked really hard to get some, some nice um, data that kind of has some hints to it, but we, we really aren't certain as to why these drugs seem to work better when you combine them. Um, and I'm, I'm working as hard as I can to try to, <laughs> to try to figure that out, both in terms he of. He has to say that. Uh, <laughs> as hard as I can, um, not as. But I, I'm, I'm working both on the, the stuff that I presented there, but I'm also trying to cast a very large net and not assume that the experiments that I have done are pointing me in the right direction. I want to find the mechanism, you know, no matter what it is, not just if it's already what I thought it should be. Um, so I think I think that's the next big step. And if we can answer that, I think that's a stepping stone to to moving this this um, further, uh, you know, perhaps into other types of cancers. But um, even in terms of getting it further in prostate cancer, I, I think we're we're going to need to know that. David, so from your point of view as a GU oncologist and an oncologist in general, where do you see this combination going next? Yeah, so the things I mentioned already were you know, biomarkers, which rely in part on understanding mechanism, uh, but also just having clinically available samples and correlating them with the things that we can measure you know, as typical standard of care. Um, so biomarkers are going to be huge. Optimizing dosing is going to be huge. Uh, and those are going to be you know, our focuses going forward with the rest of the trial. Then the next step becomes, well, what do you do with the data that you have? How do you translate that into the next trial? Um, and so typically, you know, after you've done one of these phase twos, you have to move on to the phase three randomized trial. And so we're already starting to think about how that might work, even as we brainstorm new combinations and new cancers that this could also be tried in. And Mark, you own the drugs, and you've already got trials going now in, in, in RAS, right. mutant colorectal cancer, and in AML, as well as castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Where would you like to see this go as far as other tumor types? Well, I mean, I think we've, we've well, I've just, first just back up. I mean, I think in prostate cancer, this is, you know, this is huge. I mean, if we're, and what's ahead of us and where we have to go, those of you in the room that have developed drugs know that this, this, is, this, takes, this is a process. Uh, we're really in the beginnings of that. Um, we're, you know, we're looking for signal. We're looking to see clinical activity. We're, we're trying different dose schedules, as you hear here, three different schedules, which we think we're optimizing that for prostate cancer. We want to be standard of care in castrate-resistant prostate cancer. We, we want this drug to be standard of care. And so that is, that's a climb. And um, we, we really you know, value the relationships we have here. We get a lot of guidance from David and his colleagues as far as, you know, you know because the nuances of where you go and what patients, specifically what patients you, you go after, becomes extremely important for the success of this drug. And so, I, I mean, I'm really, um, we, we're obviously very interested in some of the other trials we're doing, but um, uh, so with, with, with uh, on Vansertib, we're looking at signal in, in colorectal cancer and in leukemias, but we're very excited about this particular indication, uh, and we believe that the uniqueness of this combination with abiraterone really could be the, really the, uh, the Achilles heel for these tumors uh, in, in prostate cancer. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying not to be sound too 
uh, lofty, even though when I'm around you know, friends, I tell them a much bigger story. I know I'm around people who actually develop drugs. So you know, I want to make sure we know that, look, we do know it takes time. We're looking for partners, too. We're looking for, we're, we're a small little company. So I think the big partners out there, they're, they're, set, they're sitting on the sidelines and saying, OK, let's, let's see some more data. They always want more data. But, but we, we, were, we are really trying to, to, to move that forward to get to that point where we can do some partnerships with some big, big pharma or larger companies that can help us get through this. So now I'd like to turn the, the, the questions over to the audience. Um, feel free to ask any one of us or all of us, and we'd be happy to take your questions. We've got roving microphones around the room, so raise your hand and a microphone will come to you. Dr. I think you're going to get there before I will. Hi, excellent talks. And, uh, oh, thanks. thanks. It's great uh, to see a graduate student succeed in the beginning at, and a postdoc succeed in the beginning because it doesn't happen every day. And, <laughs> it took some luck. It's good. There's, there's always luck involved in science. Yeah. I've, so um, this is for uh, uh, David and uh, Michael. Mark. 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 Yeah. So um, the patient characteristics of um, of the 16 patients that you put on uh, are they mostly patients that have bone metastatic disease, or is there some patients that have visceral disease, and have you seen any responses? in patients with visceral disease, which we know is really bad, right? So, Right. So yeah, just to inform everybody else in the room, so typically when you think of cancer in the bones, it's really, really bad. In prostate cancer, that turns out to be the norm. Uh, so most prostate cancer will end up in the bone sometimes very early in the disease course. Whereas we know that patients who have disease in their liver or in their lungs, that's so-called visceral disease, and that has a uniquely poor prognosis. Um, and so most of the patients here are patients who have had a really good response to abiraterone and, again, are just having their PSAs rise. So if you look at their scans, most of them don't have a lot of, quote, unquote, measurable disease, meaning big Goombas that you can put, you know, a set of calipers on. Um, so a lot of these patients will have bone disease. Some have lymph nodes, and we've actually seen lymph node responses. Um, off the top of my head, I don't recall if any patients had visceral. Yeah, I don't. I, I actually don't. I'd one. have to go back and look. Right. I don't know. If, I don't think we... But we should yeah. check before I say no. But uh, you wouldn't expect, I mean, this is a different population than the advanced CRPC setting where a good number of your patients will have visceral. This is an easy one, David. Um, the question is, I'm on a 21-day cycle right now, and, um, and it's working fine as I close in nine months. And I'm in like a trading range. It goes up a little bit, goes down a little bit. But it goes like, the, like a trading range. Could this turn into an everyday drug, as I've mentioned once before? I take high blood pressure every day, and it goes up a little bit. But it is in a range. This range is a little bit tighter range. Could this end up being my everyday pill, not to eliminate the cancer, but control it or manage it? And can I live in a trading range and get 10 more years of my life. Um, I like living, and I'm looking. And before I hear the, hear the answer, I want to thank Jesse so much. And everyone else here. And David, and Mark, and the gentleman heading the lab. It means a lot to many of us. Men aren't supposed to complain. They sit, oh, God, I got this, OK. I talk a lot. And I really appreciate all the efforts being made. And I have not had many side effects. I had the white count go down for three months. Then doctor says, I don't think you need it, and I haven't had it. I had moderate fatigue down to um, a light fatigue. Two months ago, no fatigue. My hair came out in the first seven days of the drug, and never, nothing else ever came out, and it's starting growing back a little bit. I used to be tired. I'm not tired. So um, thank you for everyone, and I want to hear about the um, cycle there. Yeah, so, I mean, making a metastatic cancer into a chronic disease is kind of what we've been doing with prostate cancer for the last decade or so, turning these hormone pills into things that people can take every day and keep their cancer under control for at least months, if not years. Um, we'd rather cure it. Make no mistake. If we had a pill that could get rid of this, we would. Um, but even making it into a chronic disease is a pretty good thing if the toxicity is manageable and if it makes quality of life better, not worse. Um, and so you're highlighting that this is something that, you know, still allows you to go off to Hawaii and live your life uh, without significant impairments. 
Um, and that's exactly what we're trying to do with these new dosing schedules is increase the time on therapy without wiping out the bone marrow. And it's always going to be a trade-off between those two things. So I think that daily dosing would have to be done at an extremely low level. What we're aiming for is to keep people on for two weeks out of every three at a much lower level and see whether we can get more, you know, catch more of these cells that are slowly turning over, um, catch them in that, you know, phase of mitosis uh, where this drug might be most active. Uh, over the last uh, several years, there's been a lot of controversy over using PSA levels for diagnosing prostate cancer. So, David, I was encouraged to see that you're using PSA levels as a biomarker. Can you talk a little about that and whether it's been better validated now, or is this why you're saying you're looking for other biomarkers? Sure. So, so PSA is a remarkably crummy diagnostic tool. Um, we know that, uh, well, there's a lot of controversy about screening, which I won't get into, but uh, we know that not everybody with prostate cancer has an elevated PSA, and many people with an elevated PSA do not have prostate cancer. Um, after treatment for prostate cancer, so after you've had a surgery or radiation, or if you've been treated with hormone therapy for prostate cancer, it turns out to be a remarkably good indicator of treatment response. Um, so that's the differentiation there. And because it's downstream of that androgen receptor, it turns out to be particularly good for things that target that pathway. It may not be quite as good as we get into some of the novel therapies like immunotherapies. Um, so I think that people are always looking for other ways of assessing, be they scans or circulating tumor cells or circulating tumor DNA. Um, but uh, PSA is still a backbone of, of you know, assessing response in correlation with symptoms and scans. Thank you. Hi, uh, I don't know who this question is addressed to, but I was just wondering if you could uh, give a little more color on sort of the patient population. When we looked at the first couple of slides, uh, you know, the incidence of prostate cancer, you know, a tremendous number of new cases every year and then a certain number of people dying. and. I guess I'm confused because in the, in the next slide where you had the treatment modality, I mean, it seemed like this was what it was there, but I, I mean, there's a lot of talk at least that says that prostate cancer for a lot of people is sort of very slow moving and can, you know, be there for 20 or 30 years. And, you know, then on the same, <coughs> on a, a different uh, note, but, you know, I think there's 100,000 radical prostatectomies a year, either da Vinci or otherwise. And so, it, and I'm not sure what the basis of the diagnosis is at the beginning. So uh, I'd love your thoughts on, I mean, there's a school of thought that says that for many people, like there's being over-treatment, like we don't need 100,000 radical prostatectomies a year. And so I'm confused because is this a very small subset of the total cancers? And I, I thought that a lot of prostate cancers weren't, uh, I don't know what your phrase was, but the androgen sensitive ones. I, I mean, if it's just localized, you know, I, I, I see a company, EDAP, which is doing high intensity focused ultrasound. And, you know, when I see them, it sounds like a good thing, but, you know, if it's already gonna spread, then, so it, your talk, was helpful, but it was also sort of very confusing to me in the sense of the bigger picture and what types of um, men this is applicable to. Sure. Thanks for that question, because it's really hard to introduce prostate cancer in three minutes. Um, so prostate cancer is a really wide spectrum of disease. It's not one disease. Um, and absolutely, there's a ton of patients out there who we don't even want to diagnose because they probably have such an indolent form of this prostate cancer. Um, Increasingly in the last decade or two, there's been a lot of interest in risk stratification. So taking patients with localized disease and using clinical criteria to differentiate those who don't need treatment and can be managed with active surveillance versus those who do need you know, radical local therapy, be it surgery or radiation. Um, what we're talking about tonight is really the patients who have either been through that stuff and then had a recurrence that spread elsewhere or patients who showed up at my door with metastatic disease, who never had the opportunity for any of that stuff. And so it is a small 
proportion of the patients with prostate cancer who have metastatic disease, but it's an, in absolute terms still a very large number of patients. And so that just goes to say that it's an incredibly common process. A lot of that prostate cancer will never be lethal, but certainly a lot of it is. Please. I would like to dispute um, both the people who are skeptical of, P of uh, PSA uh, and those who think there's over-treatment. I'm speaking from personal experience with the only marginally elevated PSA for that and other reasons I chose to have a uh, prostate biopsy. I showed a very minor focal thing. It was a 3-3, which is a, a, an average, not serious, uh, whatever. Um, being an MIT graduate and a very analytic guy, I um, uh, talked to about every doctor I, on this side of the Mississippi, probably a few others. And in the course of doing, from each doctor you talk to, you learn some, th ask better questions of the next one. And what came out um, was the BI, I can't think of his name now. He said, you know, of people like you who have a very minor focal cancer and probably can live with it, I'm well in my 70s, um, it turns out of those that choose to have the radical, and we can then do, you know, check it afterward, that fully 35% turned out to be worse. That was all I needed to hear. It came out, and sure enough, it wasn't a 3-3, it was a 3-4, and it was focal in four different places. So, gentlemen, if you have a, um, um, uh, a minor elevation, it's worth the trouble. Are we radically over-treating? What you're talking about here is the difference between public health and individual medicine. You know, in public health, it's true, we're, we're over-treating. But since we don't know who it is, and you're playing you bet your life, maybe, um, which, okay, with that background, now I'll ask a question. Since I, I follow this, um, I have read someplace that, as you say, it's many different diseases that we're finding out that some of them uh, will not metastasize beyond the prostate. Where, okay, if that's true, how close are we to knowing um, which ones will and which ones will not so we can behave accordingly? Fantastic question and background, and thanks for sharing your story. Um, I think that uh, what you're hinting at is kind of the need for improved biomarkers in that setting. So not biomarkers of PLK1 sensitivity, but instead biomarkers of who can be effectively managed without radical intervention versus those who require it. And so there have been a lot of commercially available tests now trying to look at genomics and gene expression profiles to try to get at the biology of the tumor and say, beyond just Gleason score, beyond just what I feel with my finger, uh, beyond just PSA, can we make some assessment of you know, which diseases need to be aggressively managed? And to some extent, those have been helpful, but not as helpful as we'd like. Um, I think one of the major paradigm shifts in prostate cancer has been the use of MRI to actually get a look at the entire gland and see if there's tumors that we haven't stuck a needle into um, or tumors that are in places that we couldn't even get our needle to um, via the standard uh, access point. But um, you know, this is a huge area in urology specifically of sort of you know, who should be diagnosed, who should we even pursue, and then of those patients who are diagnosed, can we really try to do a better job of risk stratification with some of these other tools? Last question. Well, since you happen to mention sticking needles into, and <laughs> I, I, I sort of take a little different position because I, I've had a PSA that's gone up and down, but mainly talking about a relative who was going up and down for seven to 12 years. He either had 12 biopsies, which are, uh, I, I don't know about people, if people are familiar with biopsies, but you know, it's my worst idea of a horror movie. Uh, <laughs> and he had at least seven and possibly 12. It's sort of, I, I forget which. And ended up, uh, uh, they finally found a tumor. But it's like just randomly sticking a bunch of needles up there and hoping, you know, if there's a tumor, you find it. And the PSA was going up and down uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, as, as did mine. I actually had a PSA today for my... Uh, an oncologist, uh, mm -hmm. um, no result yet. But um, so my question is, uh, how do you know? Uh, it, 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 it seems like the the biopsy method of, of finding a tumor is is not very uh, uh, confidence building. 
as opposed to, for example, uh, because I'm racking to get uh, endoscopic ultrasounds for pancreas, and you know they're really finding lots of things that you know cysts that it may or may not turn into uh, you know decisions you have to make. And I, I think you were talking about I, I you know I, I can't get my PCP to even do the uh, the digital. Uh, uh, manipulation to see if the uh, uh, prostate is uh, 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 enlarged. Um, it, it's it's basically you know looking at uh, uh, PSA, which again goes goes up. And oh, my triple in oh, six months, and then go back down to uh, like 1.7 or something, which you, which you don't worry about. Uh, right. So, and so I, I assume you're you're the one that's the clinician here. Uh, uh, what what range of patients do you deal with, and how do you make decisions on, on what what to do about it? Yeah, so fortunately, I don't have to make that decision because I'm not a urologist. <laughs> so in order to walk through my door, you have to have a diagnosis of cancer. But uh, we are very interested as a community in trying to improve that process. So for those of you who don't know, maybe for those of you who don't have a prostate, uh, the procedure that he's referencing involves going into the rectum and sticking a needle through the rectum 12 times in a templated fashion into the prostate. It's not the most comfortable thing in the world, and it can lead to infections and other problems. Um, that said, it's, you know, if doing a, a radical prostatectomy and removing the entire prostate were easy, then we would just skip the biopsy. It's not. Uh, it certainly leaves pa patients with plenty of long-term side effects. So one of the really interesting areas recently has been whether we should be using uh, MRI-targeted biopsies rather than these templated biopsies. And if so, is that an adjunctive or is it in place of? Um, so there's a New England Journal study looking at this, and it's still an evolving uh, clinical space. And also, we have to see you know, what the insurance companies like to pay for, because unless you have that diagnosis code of ICD-10 uh, C61, prostate cancer, unless you've been diagnosed with prostate cancer, they generally don't like paying for an MRI just to target that biopsy. Um, so, but there is a, a growing interest in kind of stratifying who should we even be trying to pursue the diagnosis in. Well, with that, I want to thank the audience. You guys have asked fantastic questions. Um, I especially want to just take a moment to thank Frank and all the patients like Frank who have volunteered to be on these clinical trials because without patients like Frank, we would never know how to better treat these types of things. And um, one more round of applause for our presenters. We've seen so much has gone into this. I feel like things happened very, very quickly, but it was a long time coming. And every single person on this stage played a huge role. And we are so thrilled that everyone can come together and work together in this way. So thank you all so much. Thank you.